good to come around the Word of God. Um, before we do that, shall we just uh, pray? Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for your Word. Thank you for the truth of the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, that it is a Word that uh, pierces our, our heart often, Lord. It's a Word that gets right down uh, into us, Lord. It doesn't just remain in our mind, Lord, but rather it goes right down to the core of our being. It produces certain emotions within us, Lord, when we read your word. Indeed, as James said, Lord, it is like a mirror uh, reflecting who we are. Uh, Lord, often we read the word and we see either uh, where we have fallen short or rather we see uh, also what, uh, what we can be in you, Lord. And so I pray that your word would be alive to us this morning, Lord. pray that it would be a living word. And I pray, Lord, that you would guide me and teach me, Lord, as I teach others uh, about the truths, the great truths of God. Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, this morning uh, we're going to start, we're going to embark upon the first of three sermons. Uh, I'm going to do a series of sermons. A while ago I preached uh, a sermon uh, entitled, What Should the Church Look Like? Um, I remember that. And I honestly felt drawn by God to revisit that subject and really to expound it a bit more. I really felt as the Lord was saying to me, you, you need to go and say some more about that. Because I feel it's very uh, uh, important for us at this time to consider um, <coughs> what, what it means to be a church. So I've entitled this, this series of sermons, Rediscovering uh, the Church. Um, maybe you've had it in your life where you, you, you have something really useful, really important, and you lose it. And then one day you suddenly, you know, you open a drawer and there it is and you say, oh, what well, have I found? I found, and it was there all the time, but you had to kind of rediscover it. And I, and I feel that in a sense, here in the West, we, we've lost a lot. A lot of it's been, been covered over uh, by other things, the truth of what the church really is. And I feel there's a, there's a sense in which we need to rediscover a bit more about, you know, what was the New Testament church really like? What lessons can we learn as a church from that? So I hope that you will find it um, interesting. There's a lot of conversations going on at the moment, amongst, particularly amongst evangelicals, <coughs> about what kind of church is going to reach the people of this generation. What, what, what's that church going to be like? Is it going to be uh, maybe it's going to be a church that has its own building, right? Or maybe even several buildings, maybe a, a, a cafe or, or maybe a men's home or a women's home. But, you know, lots of, like a whole complex of, of buildings. Maybe that's the kind of church that we need for this generation to reach them. Or other people are saying, well, no, I think it's probably going to be just like, you know, little house churches meeting together, just a few Christians uh, meeting amongst themselves. What, what, what are we supposed to, what are we supposed to dress like when you, you go and take the go like this suit and tie, or is it strictly jeans and t-shirt? You know, how, how, what should we dress like, or what kind of music should we have? Contemporary music, flashing lights maybe, or, or should we go? No, it's going to be traditional hymns. Whilst we can have some interesting discussions about those things, I want to say this. None of those things actually answers the question. They don't answer how we're going to reach this generation for Christ. The only kind of church that is going to reach this generation is quite simply a church that is moving in the power of God. That's it. Okay. All these other things are totally peripheral. It is the church moving in the power of God. You see, you can't win someone to Christ with a gimmick. And you can't disciple someone with a gimmick. It has to be the power of God. So as we go through uh, this series of sermons, um, we are going to rediscover the New Testament church. We are going to reconnect 
with their scriptural legacy and we will reassess our lives and our roles in this community that we call a church in the light of biblical truth. That's what I'm hoping uh, that, 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 we can, that we can do. I've called this first sermon Motivation and Mentality. What was the motivation of the early church? What was their mentality? How were they, how were they thinking? You know, when Jesus died and he was buried and he finally ascended to heaven, why did they just say, well, that's great, you know, we, we've, we've, when, when Pentecost came and they received the Holy Spirit, when they just say, right, that's great, we'll just go off now and live our, our own individual lives, we've got the truth, you know, we've got the Holy Spirit, that, that's all we need, you know, maybe we'll meet up again, maybe once a month or something like that, or maybe if we're really busy, once a year, but we've got our own lives. What, what was it that was keeping them together? What was motivating them to continue in fellowship at a time when it was extremely dangerous to be meeting together like that? Why didn't they just say, oh, oh you know, let's, let's keep it quiet, let's go on separate ways? What was, the, what was the motivator? I believe it's the Holy Spirit. I believe it's the Holy Spirit living within them. You know, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. That power enabled them to remain as a community, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Acts 2 46. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that enabled them to be bold and to continue meeting even under the threat of persecution and imprisonment. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit that draws us together into fellowship, to assemble together. There's also something else. You know, a little earlier on in verse 42 of, um, of Acts chapter 2, it says this, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. So it wasn't just the power of the Holy Spirit within them. They were steadfastly committed to continuing in the apostles' doctrine. Don't let anybody tell you that what you believe, that your understanding of the Bible doesn't really matter. That it's all about relationships. This is part of the, the, the stuff that keeps us together, is sound doctrine, particularly in this day, and I don't need to go into all the reasons why that is, most of you are aware of it, but sound doctrine is being eroded in our day. We must stand, as we sang earlier, on the promises of God. We must, in order to stand on them, you have to know them, don't you? You have to know the Word of God in order to stand on those promises. This is the motivation that's keeping them together, keeping them as a community, being of one accord, the Bible says, being of one mind. Their understanding of apostolic doctrine, their understanding of how a person becomes a Christian. You have your Bible with you, let's turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5. And I'm going to read from Romans chapter 5, verse, starting in verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, experience hope. And hope maketh not 
Not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. What well, a great scriptural statement and it's a great theological statement in there. That we have peace through Christ and Him alone. There in verse 1. That we have access to grace by faith alone. That we stand in grace and by grace alone. And that the love of God shed abroad in our hearts brings us sanctification. And who do we thank for that? It's to the glory of God alone, isn't it? It's not by our own works. Or to put it another way. Familiar with these phrases? Solus Christus, Christ alone. Sola fide, faith alone. Sola gratia, grace alone. Sola deo, gloria to the glory of God alone. How do we know all this stuff? Sola scriptura, by scripture alone. A man didn't teach us this. It wasn't somebody who said, oh, I've got something new I've got to tell you now. This isn't new, is it? Although these are known as the five souls of the Protestant Reformation, they didn't invent them. They were always here in Romans chapter 5, but they had to rediscover them. That's what we're doing this morning. We're rediscovering. What was the church like? It's a sad day in a way, isn't it, that we have to ask that question. What is the New Testament church really like? But you know, sometimes that's how it is. I want to preach this morning about the thing that keeps us together as a church, about the glue, if you like, if the motivator is the Holy Spirit. Well, what is it that He brings that keeps us together? What is it He brings that helps us to function and gives us that mentality of the early New Testament church? Well, we, we read it there in Romans chapter 5. That the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. He pours out the love of God into your heart when you become a Christian. And that's what I want to preach about this morning. Is love. It's the love of God that binds Christians together. It's the reason why when the clock is ticking... And everybody's still still talking away and, and, and saying, well, we've got to really go now. But can I just talk to you about something? I just read this in the Bible. You know, I just, I just had this experience with the Lord. And I want to share it with you, talk to you about it. And why does it go on like that for so long? Well, it's like iron sharpening iron, the Bible says. It's like a blade rubbing against another blade. It makes it sharper, makes it more efficient. To the task. And maybe you've experienced that. Maybe you, you've met with another, a Christian brother or sister and you, you start talking about the things of the Lord and you weren't planning to stay there very long, uh, but after a while the time ceases to have any meaning because you're both feeding off the power of the Holy Spirit. You can both feel it. And you don't know what it is. It's not so much what you're saying, but it's the presence of God there, isn't it? Anyone know what I'm talking about? I felt that yourself, yeah. So the Bible goes, says, I am sharpening. I am. Nominal Christians do not understand this. It's a mystery uh, to them. But it's why we're drawn to fellowship. It's why we want to come together and spend time together. It's the importance of constant fellowship, as has been uh, quoted this morning. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Hebrews 10, 25. As the manner of some is. Yes, it's the manner of some. But don't let it be your manner. Just because others may do it. Don't you do it. You make it a priority to be in fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's what's going to hold us together. It's that love for one another. And it's a love that's been poured out by God. It's a divine love. It comes from God. 
a while ago, um, my family and I were looking for a church, and we went into this great big church. I don't know how many would be in the congregation, a big church building, and quite a large congregation. And we went there, I don't know, I think it was something like seven weeks we went there. I'll, I won't name the church. Um, but I think all the time that we were there, I think two people said hi to us. You know, and, and the tragedy is, I later found out from someone, they have a welcome team <laughs> whose job it is to welcome people. We didn't feel too welcome there. You know, there wasn't too much of an expression of love. And someone once said, you know, some of the churches today can be so cold, so without love, that you can bring a, a bucket of milk in through the, the doors, and by the time it gets to the lectern, it's ice cream. Uh, <laughs> I, I hope that we won't ever be a church that people can say that of. But, you know, we need to express our love to one another, don't we? How do we do that? How does the church express its love uh, to one another? Yeah. There we go. <coughs> Here are some verses of scriptures that express what that's like. We're to show kindness. Humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. Colossians 3.13. It's forbearing, it's being humble, it's being patient with one another, isn't it? Again, Ephesians 4, 2-3. Walk worthy with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit. It's not always about being right, is it? I, I know he was wrong now. I'm just going to rush over and tell him that he's wrong. Well, there's a way of doing that, isn't there? We want to keep the unity of the Spirit. We want to forbear, be tolerant with one another. So, no problems there. Most people would say, yep, yeah, that, that sounds like love to me. Here comes the more difficult ones. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbour and not suffer sin upon him. Leviticus 19, 17. What does that mean? It means that if your brother is in sin, and you know it, you have a duty, a responsibility... To go to that person and to rebuke them for their sin. Why? Because if you don't, that sin remains upon them and the judgment of God is upon them. So is that loving if you know somebody's in sin and that therefore the judgment of God is upon them? Is it loving to say nothing? I won't say anything to them. I'll just I'll go away and pray, pray for them. No, no, the Bible's saying, no, you've got to rebuke your neighbour and not suffer sin upon him. You've got to go and see him. Wow, that makes it really difficult, doesn't it? That makes it, you can't just put on the Sunday face and be a nice sort of middle class person, you know, and saying, oh yes, very civilised and polite. That gets a bit more messy, doesn't it? That's like human relation. You know, you're going to somebody and saying, I really need to talk to you about this issue. But what that does is it opens our hearts to one another. We're being real with each other then, aren't we? We're not pretending that, you know, we're not over here in our little uh, uh, enclave, our own little world, our own family, and you're over there in yours, and occasionally we meet on a Sunday morning, say hello to one another, or we talk about some things of the Bible. Now we're talking about each other's lives and what we do. And that is really what a church is meant to be. We're meant to get right down there and be honest with one another. You know, that can be a real blessing. You just open up to another person, you're just honest with them, and just share share your heart with you. Then the relationship deepens so much more, doesn't it? Than if you're just trying to, to keep your distance and so on. The other thing we're called to do is Galatians 6 verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I said it before, a lot of people don't even know Christ has laws. Well, he does. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. How do you do that? You bear their burdens. You bear their burdens. You come alongside 
and you help them. Just think about the person who's sitting next to you uh, this morning. Maybe it's your husband or wife. Do they have burdens in their life? Do they have things that are troubling them? Do you know that? If you don't know, how can you come alongside and help them and support them? The New Testament church was very much involved with one another. They met together daily. You believe that? They met together daily and they shared one another's burdens. There is a corporate responsibility there are no lone monk type figures in the New Testament church. Somebody wandering around with a staff, you know, by himself, like a hermit. You know, we are called to a corporate responsibility. This is the kind of mentality, that, that the endeavouring to be there for others that we need in the church today. Maybe you say, well... I, I like being in this church, I feel it's blessed me, and you know, I'm, I'm really going on with the Lord, I had a great time in the praise and worship, you know, Roger's playing there, it's just, just feel like I'm being transcended to another level, Paul's singing, <laughs> but it's possible, isn't it, to have a wonderful time in praise and worship with yourself. And, and, and to go back, I said, the, the Bible is just alive to me. I've just I've read so many, you know, chapters and verses. It's just wonderful. It's come alive to me, the Word of God. And I'm, I'm having a great time with the Lord at the moment. You know, He's really teaching me some things. I'm having a great time sharing the gospel with others. Well, I'm going to shock you this morning. It's not all about you. Okay? It's not all about you. There are others here. There are other people who may not be doing quite so well as you. It's not all about you. It's not even all about your family, your husband or your wife. That's something I have to learn. Okay? It's not all about your family. It's about coming together with other brothers and sisters in Christ. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 29, But this I say, brethren, the time is short, it remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they have none. He said, Paul's saying, yeah, you've got a wife and you've got responsibilities there. But there's something actually even more important than that. You a quote here from, from John Wesley. Explaining that verse, he says it plainly follows. That even they who have wives be as serious, zealous, active, dead to the world, as devoted to God, as holy in all manners of conversation, as if they had none. Don't stay away from fellowship just because you're having a great time with your family or a great time with your wife. Bring them with you. With all the appropriate caveats, obviously, added there and exceptions. But if possible, bring them with you into fellowship. What counts in the church, what truly avails is what Galatians 5 verse 6 says. Faith which worketh by love. Love is the essence of that motivation. It is the presence in our mentality. The love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. A church without love is not a church. It is an organization. It is a corporation. It's a body of people. But it is not the body of Christ. Now we've spoken about the love of believers for believers. But what about non-Christians? What about those people that come here who are not Christians? They may be Christians in name only. But they have not got 
the Spirit. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verse 9. Says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. See what, what Paul's saying there. If you don't have the spirit of Christ in you, you're none of his. You're, you're not a Christian, is what he's saying. Now, now, that sounds shocking to some people, but that's the Bible's definition of what a Christian is. It doesn't matter how other people define it, that's how the Bible defines it. Okay? If you don't have the Spirit of God, you have the Spirit of Christ, then you are not a Christian, therefore you're not technically part of the church. The word church is from the Greek, ecclesia. Or ecclesia, meaning called out ones, those who have been called by God, in whom His Spirit dwells. So, where does it leave those people then? Do we, as a church, say to them, "Well, sorry, you you can't come. This is our private club. We're gonna we're gonna shut the doors to you. You're not you're not a proper Christian, so you can't come in. You know, I'm gonna leave you outside." Do we say, you know, members only? Sorry. You can't come in, you can't join us here. There's a great verse in the Bible that is the words of the Lord Jesus. Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Matthew 11 verse 28. What I say to anybody who's coming to this assembly this morning, this, this group of people, is come to Jesus. Come to Jesus Christ. And I really feel this needs saying. You know, people who are religious, people who, who kind of have a belief about Jesus Christ, but they don't have His Spirit dwelling within them, to them, religion or Christianity is, is a labour. It's a heavy labour, you know. It's like carrying a burden. They know they ought to do it. They know they have certain moral responsibilities. But it's a real labour. It's not a joy. It's just something they have to do. I'm sorry, but you only have to watch the Jehovah's Witnesses walking around your street. It's a slow drag, isn't it? They're just clocking up their hours. Why? Because to them, religion is just a drag. But it's something they feel they ought to do. They, they know it's the right thing to do and they ought to do it. But there's no joy in it. They come to Christ and He will take away that burden. Come to Jesus Christ. He will relieve that weight. What I have to say to you today, if you're in that position, if you haven't yet got the Spirit of God, I want you to... Here, here, three things. Firstly, you are welcome here. You're welcome. Secondly, you are accepted here. I was going to shut the door in your face. You're accepted here. And thirdly, you are loved. You are loved. But it is with an honest love. We will come alongside. We will support you. We will help you. But it will be accompanied by an exhortation to accept God's free gift of salvation. That's the kind of love that the church needs to have. That's why Jesus died. That's the kind of love that he showed. It's an evangelistic love. We've got to have that, people, as a church. We've got to keep that going. It, we, it's so easy, you know, if you get a lot of people in and you start saying, well, we're a little bit hesitant. I don't say anything to put so-and-so off. 
We've got to have a real love, an honest love, an evangelistic love that cares not just about that the person's coming, but cares about the person's soul, where they are with God. We've got to have and keep and rediscover, if it's been lost, that evangelistic love. That is God's heart, isn't it? That's why Jesus came, because God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. That was the emphasis. That's the whole reason why Jesus came. Not just to be nice to people, but to heal people, but so that they could be saved, so that they could know what it is to have a living relationship with God. And that's the kind of church we have to be. We must be. Otherwise, I'm telling you, we are usurpers. We are supplanters. We are traitors to the New Testament church. That was the kind of church they were. They brought the love of God with them. They weren't interested in just being nice to people. They were bringing the love of God that really cared about people. Yes, they helped people. They gave them food. They, 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 they met their need. Whatever was missing, you know. Yes, they were kind. Yes, they were forbearing. All those things that we, that we looked at. Yes, they were humble. They, they bore one another's burdens. But they also took the gospel with them. They didn't forget that the most important and the most uh, uh, loving thing that a church can do is share the gospel of Jesus Christ with everybody. Now that doesn't mean in your face, finger wagging, you're a sinner, you need to repent. It means sharing it in a way that is going to be most effective for that person at that particular time. That takes spiritual discernment. It takes the study of the word. It takes time, spending time in God's presence, praying for that person. We must, we must do that. We must do away with all hypocrisy, laziness, selfishness, and unbelief. In the church. It's got to go. We're going to see God move. It's just got to go. You know, I was watching, um, have you ever heard of Asbury College in, uh, in the States, right? There was a revival there in about 1970, something like that. The Spirit of God moved in just an incredible way. And it started so simply. They had a chapel service. The person who was leading the chapel uh, just said, Would somebody like to come up and just share what God's been doing? in their life and this person came up and he gave a testimony and something he said just touched the heart of somebody else there so another student got up and they said can I give my my testimony and he said yes and the chapel should have ended something like an hour afterwards it was still going on at 10 o'clock at night the whole student body had come together and one after another was just standing up sharing, just being honest with everybody just sharing you know, their, their, their failings, their sins, saying, and asking people to forgive them. That's love, isn't it? That's the kind of love that we want. It's where we'll just be honest with one another, we'll just share, share our hearts with one another, share our lives with one another. You've got to have commitment for that to happen. You've got to be committed, not just to Christ, not just to the gospel, but committed to one another for that to happen and that's what I want to really implore you to do today if you truly commit yourself to your brothers and sisters here in the light of God's word and, and taking everything on board that that says walking in obedience, walking in holiness then I believe that God can do amazing things it doesn't matter how, how, how many of us or how few of us there are I think we'll see a real change can, we can really see a church going out and reaching this generation. As I said at the beginning, the only church that will reach this generation is a church that is moving in the power of God. Everything else is peripheral. It really is. When it comes down to reaching people and, and to just continue to then to disciple them, we must be moving in the power of God. To quote the old hymn, and I'll finish with this. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. 
stiff with his love if he be friendly.